The Origins of SpaceX Part 4 If you haven't seen the first three parts, I highly recommend that you go back and check those out. But to continue on, SpaceX is finally stable. Up until this point, they've only either been trying to survive or prove themselves in the aerospace industry. But with the success of the Falcon 9 and the first cargo mission to the International Space Station, we can finally see that SpaceX has made it and they can begin to focus on what they really want to, being reusability. But before we discuss the reusability program, let's briefly touch base on some of the other projects they had going on at the time. The first one being a contract that they signed with NASA NASA for $440 million. This project was to help fund the development of a crewed capsule to the International Space Station. So basically turning Cargo Dragon into Crew Dragon, or also known as Dragon 2. There's a lot of different names for this project. But ultimately, the original plans were to have seven astronauts to be carried to the International Space Station in this Crew Dragon. And in addition, they wanted the first launch to happen by 2017. Now another project that had proposed funding for the time was a concept called Red Dragon, which as you could probably assume is a spacecraft similar to Cargo Dragon, however instead of just going to low Earth orbit, it would aim to go to the red planet Mars, and ideally be able to propulsively land on the surface and then release whatever payloads would have on board. Not necessarily for crewed missions, but rather just robotic missions or just tests to see whether or not things could work on Mars. Now another project at the time SpaceX had been working on was the Merlin 1D engine, which would be an upgrade from the Merlin 1C. This engine is actually used currently in the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets and has a 50% upgrade from the Merlin 1C before. Now there have been more iterations since then, however at the time this was a big upgrade to the rocket they had been using for the Falcon 9. But the Merlin 1D wasn't the only rocket engine they were working on at the time. SpaceX had announced the development of what would later be called the Raptor engine. This would aim to be several times stronger than the Merlin phase of engines, and in addition would use a completely different type of rocket fuel, which they kept secret for one month when they finally announced that it was methane based. And the reason for it to be methane based is so that you could create rocket fuel on Mars and then come back to Earth using the propellant that you actually create on the red planet. So now that we've touched base on some of the other projects SpaceX was working on in 2012, we can talk about their reusability project, actually making step towards lowering the cost to orbit. And this began with the Grasshopper rocket, a rocket that was never meant to go to space only consisting of a single Merlin 1D engine with a booster on top of it that was mainly just the rocket fuel tank of a version 1 Falcon 9. In addition, it had rigid landing legs. It didn't come back down. They just stuck there on the side. And the main goal for this was to progressively hop at higher altitudes to see how well they could actually perform this rocket using the controlled sequence they had. Now, all of the test flights of the Grasshopper rocket took place at SpaceX's test facility in McGregor, Texas. Now, vertical landing had been accomplished before, but not necessarily at this scale or this size of a rocket. Therefore, Elon Musk had to go out many times and discuss what he actually saw for the future of reusability in rockets. He usually went out to say something like, if on Star Trek they got a new ship after every mission, it would be silly. If we want a space beyond Earth, it's critical we solve this problem. He would also go on to say that they would eventually want to get accuracy down to that of a helicopter landing, but instead of a helicopter, it being the Grasshopper rocket or even the Falcon 9 eventually. So now we're gonna go through some of the videos and see how exactly the Grasshopper progressively got higher and higher in its hops. The first flight occurring on September 21st of 2012, the rocket only flew for three seconds and got to a height of 1.8 meters. If you see in the video, you can barely tell that it's actually getting off the ground. It's mostly just dust that's being picked up by the camera. Then for the second flight, it flew a little bit longer, but only for eight seconds and reaching a height of 5.4 meters. This was a little bit over a month after the first flight. Now it's kind of hard to tell how massive these rockets are just from these videos. So SpaceX had the idea of putting a cowboy mannequin on the side of the grasshopper rocket to show you the scale of how big an actual person would be. So in the third flight on December 17th, it flew for 29 seconds and as you can see on the side there, there is that mannequin. It reached a height of 40 meters and at its maximum altitude it had an extended hover period where it tried to just stay in its place for a little while. Let's put the grasshopper rocket on pause for a second and discuss SpaceX as a whole. 
We have now reached the end of 2012 and they are on a roll. They haven't had many failures over the past few years ever since the Falcon 1. And with the Falcon 9 and Dragon Capsule being successful in getting to low Earth orbit, a lot of companies are seeing this as an option to get to space in a cheaper manner. Therefore, by the end of 2012, they had 40 launch contracts signed, which could potentially be up to $4 billion in revenue for the company. Then to continue their success into 2013, they had another launch of the Falcon 9, taking another cargo mission to the International Space Station. This one more specifically using the unpressurized trunk of the Dragon capsule. And this mission ended up being success and ultimately the last flight of version 1 of the Falcon 9. The later ones would be the updated version, which I'll get to later in the video. So now let's jump back into the Grasshopper rocket and see more of the developments that they had made. Now, on March 7th of 2013, it flew for 34 seconds and reached an altitude of 80 meters. Now this was the first attempt of what is called a hover slam landing, which is a very efficient method of landing an object, but it's also very risky because if you start too late or too early, you'll probably run out of fuel and then eventually crash into the surface. Now if you want to learn more about hover slam landings or just how SpaceX lands their vehicles altogether, let me know in the comments and I might make a video about that in the future. Then a little over a month later they did another launch of the Grasshopper rocket flying for 58 seconds reaching a maximum altitude of 250 meters and as you can see from the dust cloud that comes from the initial takeoff it was the windiest day they had so far. So this was mainly a test to see how well they could perform under high wind velocities. Then a couple months later another flight of the Grasshopper rocket took place. This one flew for 68 seconds, reaching a maximum altitude of 325 meters, and this one tested certain navigation sensors that would be able to improve its ability to land on a specific location. Then another launch would take place just a couple months later on August 13th of 2013, where they went for a lower altitude, but instead did a divert test where the rocket moved 100 meters to the side and then tried to come back down and land in the same spot, using some of the navigational features that they had implemented in the previous launch. So let's put the Grasshopper rocket on pause for a moment and look at what was going on with the Falcon 9. On September 29th of 2013 was going to be the first flight of the newest version of the Falcon 9, version 1.1. In addition, it would be the first flight they would have from Vandenberg Air Force Base and also the first flight they had using a commercially owned payload. Now there are a lot of differences between the original version of the Falcon 9 and the one that they were using for this launch. Mainly that it was much more powerful, much bigger, and much stronger. It could take 3,000 more kilograms to low Earth orbit, stood 20 meters taller, and had a different engine arrangement in its first stage, being an octo-web shape rather than a 9x9 grid. In addition, they replaced all the engines from the Merlin 1C to the Merlin 1D, thus making it just a much more powerful rocket altogether. Now, the launch would also try and test their landing capabilities, not necessarily on a barge or on land, but just to see how well they could slow themselves down to try and get onto the ocean and maybe even save it if it landed successfully. Now what ended up happening was the launch was successful, it got the payload into orbit, however during its descent it experienced a much higher rolling motion than they originally expected and therefore weren't able to successfully recover the booster. Now they weren't really expecting to be able to reuse the rocket or even get it, but rather to see what actually is happening to this vehicle when it comes back from space and how well can we actually control it. And for the most part they did a pretty good job, however they learned a lot from the data and then continued on with their reusability missions. So then moving on onto August 7th, just about a week later in 2013, the Grasshopper or the first version of the Grasshopper would make its final flight, lasting for 79 seconds and reaching an altitude of 744 meters, which just so happened to be 16 meters below the FAA limit that they had set for them. Now even though they almost reached their max altitude that they were allowed to go to, and this was the last flight of the first version of the Grasshopper rocket, this wasn't the end of their reusability testing. They actually had a second version, version 1.1, that had an upgraded booster basically being bigger to replicate the booster from the newest version of the Falcon 9. In addition, they had retractable landing legs and could now fly up to 3,000 meters. 
Therefore, they could do a lot more testing. Now, the development of the new version of the Grasshopper rocket would continue for the remainder of 2013. But this wasn't the only major thing going on at the time. SpaceX actually successfully launched a geostationary satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. So why is this so important? Well, a geostationary transfer orbit is more challenging than just getting into a low Earth orbit. It requires a lot more energy from the launch vehicle to set it up for this type of trajectory. And a lot of companies noticed this. So by the end of 2013, SpaceX had signed contracts for 50 future launches over the next coming years. And this is really important because other companies in the aerospace industry were claiming they were losing money because of what SpaceX was able to do. Starting to see a shift in actually being able to lower the cost to orbit. So then if we fast forward four months, we get to the first launch of the new version of the Grasshopper rocket. This ended up reaching a maximum altitude of 250 meters, but also moved sideways and hovered at this maximum altitude, as you can see in the video. Then the very next day on April 18th, another attempt of a controlled landing in the ocean would occur. Again, not on a barge, but rather just in the ocean, just trying to see if they could actually successfully perform it. Now what ended up happening is it was a successful launch, the rocket took the second stage to a suborbital flight where the first stage then separated and returned around at a velocity of 10,000 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 80 kilometers, where three of the nine Merlin engines ignited and brought it to an ideal trajectory. Then it would perform a successful controlled touchdown on the ocean, making it another first for the company. However, rough seas ended up destroying the booster. Now this was a major success for SpaceX because they were able to show that this research they had been doing with the Grasshopper rockets could be portrayed in the actual Falcon 9. Now to move back to the Grasshopper rocket, on May 1st it would do the exact same thing that it did previously, instead it reached a maximum altitude of 100 meters. Now another flight would take place on June 17th, and this was testing their new grid fins as you can see in the video. And mainly, these grid fins would help control the rocket when it's experiencing high speeds for aerodynamic control. So in the video, you can see when the grid fins slant in one direction, it causes the rocket to pitch or to rotate, which you can actually see from the ground moving in the video. Now another flight would happen on August 1st, but not a lot of information was given to the public regarding what actually happened on this flight. And then finally, on August 22nd of 2014, the rocket would again perform some more tests. But during the flight, it was directed off its planned flight path, and therefore it was told to self-destruct. Later, the issue was related to a faulty sensor, but in the real Falcon 9, there'd be a few backup sensors in case something like this was to happen. Now, there were some initial plans to continue the Grasshopper rocket and to have something that could go up to 90,000 meters. However, this was eventually canceled or postponed due to the success with what they were seeing with the Falcon 9. Now, since they were showing success with the booster, they then wanted to see whether or not they could actually do the same thing with the Dragon capsule. So they started a mission called Dragonfly, which would be able to see how well they could propulsively land a Dragon capsule on land or on the sea. Now throughout the rest of 2014, SpaceX had quite a few more launches, three of which were also experiments trying to see whether or not they recover the first stage. And then by the end of the year, they announced that they were gonna be using a barge to try and recover these boosters, mainly to have a landing zone for the actual rocket to land on. This being 18 meters by 52 meters in size, which is fairly small when you relate that to the actual size of the rocket booster. Now on January 10th of 2015, SpaceX was going to try and land their first booster on a barge. And this got a lot of attention from the press, mainly because they had recently said they want to use a barge, this was the first one with grid fins, and basically a lot of people were optimistic that this would work. I mean, the company as a whole said it probably wouldn't and it would mainly just be an experiment. However, a lot of other people outside of the company thought it would be successful. So let's see what actually happened with that launch. First of all, you can see the launch actually was a success. It cleared the tower, separation was successful, and then it returned back towards the barge. This being pretty impressive, but as we watched, it actually doesn't successfully land. It crashes into the barge. However, it's still really impressive that they were able to get the rocket that close to a barge in the middle of the ocean. Then a few months later, they attempted again with one of NASA's cargo missions and something very similar happens. They try and launch it and it eventually just tips over and falls. Now, then again, a few months later, SpaceX attempts another landing on the barge. So let's go ahead and see what happens with the launch. 
this one being on June 28th of 2015. And as we can see, the launch appears to be successful as normal. It clears the tower and everything is performing pretty much perfectly. But just over two minutes into flight, something goes wrong. The failure was later found out to be a structural failure of a strut that held a section of a helium tank within the oxygen tank. And what happened was when the strut failed, it actually released helium into the oxygen tank of the second stage, which overpressurized the tank, causing it to explode and thus causing the entire rocket to fail. Now, since this was NASA's cargo mission, they ended up doing a study to see what exactly probably went wrong so that maybe it could be improved in the future. And they ended up announcing that SpaceX had used the wrong material for one of their eye bolts. They used something that had a lower factor of safety than needed, and thus once it failed, it destroyed the entire mission. That just goes to show how critical every component of these rockets truly is to the mission. Now this was a pretty major setback for the company, mainly because they were on a roll, they were really being successful up until this point, and they hadn't had a failure this big until 4 or 5 years ago back when they were launching the Falcon 1. Therefore, they took some time and they were preparing one of the first tests for Dragonfly. But right before they could do that, this and happened. Off. Main engine cut out. PM confirmed separation. Main parachute deploy. Touchdown. LGS deploy. Welcome back, New Shepard. On November 23rd of 2015, a company by the name of Blue Origin gets a lot of attention when their new Shepard booster lands on Earth vertically after successfully launching something into space, being a first not only for the company, but for the entire world. This got a lot of attention because no one really knew about Blue Origin until this point in time where everyone was trying to see SpaceX succeed. So how do they recover from this? What happens in the future? And how does this lead up to current day SpaceX? In the next video, we're going to cover all of those things. So thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.